Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this session. Um, my name is Rohit. Uh, I work with uh, AWS. And it's my absolute uh, honor and privilege uh, to introduce you to uh, James Staten, who is a vice president with Forrester Research. And James has a fantastic session uh, focused on uh, the changing role of system admin in this cloud era. So with that, let me pass over the baton to James. Welcome, Great. James. Thanks very yeah. much. Thanks. And thank you all for coming and being here with us today. Um, just so I get a sense of who's in the audience, how many of you are sysadmins? OK, great. How many of you are rogue AWS developers who didn't tell your sysadmin you were coming? OK, great. I, I didn't expect you to raise your hand, so we'll assume there's a few more of you here. Um, so this is very much aimed at system admins, so I'm glad to see so many of you here in the audience. Um, and I, how many of you are currently sysadmining the AWS environment for your company? OK, great. So bear with me, those of you, as we go through the beginning of this, for the people that aren't currently administering it. We're going to get to what's valuable to you a little bit later in the presentation. So the, the obligatory data slide. We all know cloud adoption is growing. As you can see from this data, SaaS continues to be the leader. There are significantly more companies using SaaS than the other types of cloud services that are out there. When we look at the other two types, infrastructure service and platform services, quite a bit more adoption of infrastructure services you would expect. Um, what you'll notice on here is the actual numbers from 2012 was 30%, growing up to about 40%, which is actually a pretty fast ramp. Uh, for the use of, of infrastructure as a service. So we are seeing a tremendous amount of enterprises who are now jumping on board to use these services and move them out into the market. Now, as you probably have noticed from a lot of the things that have been said here at this conference, the people who take us into these platforms as a service are the developers. So if we look at these numbers, are these numbers relatively close to the same amount of developers who are using these services? Well, when we look at that data, we find that 24%, one out of every four developers in our developer survey, told us they are using cloud services in some way. That doesn't mean that one out of every four developers in your corporation are doing things on AWS. It doesn't mean they're doing things on infrastructure as a service. But it does show that they are leaning in that direction. Now, that, of course, means that three out of every four are not. They're doing back office applications, traditional applications, modifications, patching, and other things inside of the shop. So of the 24% who are going out there and are using these cloud services today, what are they doing? A lot of people think that what they're mostly doing is test and dev. So we really, in IT operations and in sysadmin roles, don't need to be too worried about that. Well, what they told us is, yes, they are doing test and dev. That's about a third of what they're doing. But if you add up all the other things that they're doing, there's a lot of things that feel like hmm, corporate activities, application integrations. This is oftentimes connecting a SaaS application or an application you deploy an infrastructure service to something inside the data center. Uh, mobile sites, mobile applications, you would expect that. There's a high correlation between mobile application design and cloud backends as a service. You heard, them, heard Andy talk about that in his keynote today, that they're building a series of mobile enablement capabilities in the platform in order to make that happen, be more popular here. Then you see some other things, intranets, um, internal web applications, things that are being used inside the walls of the company but are being put on a public site. Now, you wouldn't think that that's really all that natural a thing to do on a public cloud, but why that's happening on public cloud is because our companies are no longer everyone in the St. Louis headquarters. They're all over the place, distributed geographically, and so reaching out through public services to deliver these capabilities is actually a growing trend that we see pretty dra dramatically across organizations. Now, then if you look further down the list, there's a bunch of other things you'd expect. Brand new business applications, high performance computing, batch applications, business analytics, marketing sites, and of course, e-commerce that are all happening here. So when you take a look at this, notice that none of this stuff is less than, say, 22%, which means there's lots of developers here who are in charge of multiple application types across these different kinds. What you also see here is that this is a lot of stuff that if you're given the choice to say, are you just doing test and dev, or are you doing other things in here, and you choose things that are over here, that means you're not just testing them. That means you're actually deploying them into production. And that's very much also what our data shows us, is that the 24% of developers who are using cloud services are not testing there and then deploying back in the data center. They're deploying it back out into that public service that they're using. Now, oftentimes, IT operations is a little surprised at how many developers are doing this and what kind of projects they're doing. And that's oftentimes because of this type of data. 
what it shows is that a lot of times the, the developers who are going out and are using the cloud are doing it at the behest of the business, not at the behest of IT, which oftentimes results in what we call shadow IT, where they are circumventing the IT department going out and doing these things. And that's not a very good situation if you're a sysadmin, because that means that there's a lot of development going around outside of your purview. Outside of your purview is also what we should look at next to say what exactly are they doing out there. I wouldn't be so worried as a sysadmin if the majority of what they were doing was sites that were using publicly accessible information and were not using company corporate intellectual property. But as you can see here from this data, while yes, a lot of the use is public data, what is growing is the use of corporate intellectual property. And down is going the public only. Then we talk about what kind of intellectual property are they using. We're finding that they're putting customer records out there on the cloud, and they're putting core business transactions out there on the cloud. These are increasing growth areas. Nowhere near 50% of what they're doing, but you can see the trend represented here, which says very much that if you're in the IT world and you're thinking, well, our company's not really doing a whole lot in cloud. We're not doing anything that touches our key intellectual property. We're not doing anything in production. We're not doing anything that would pose a risk to our company. Sorry, too late. That's already happening. The developers have enough experience. They have enough trust in these platforms that that's exactly what they're doing. They're now going out there and putting things in the cloud. And as I mentioned, they're doing this at the behest of the business, which means they're not necessarily going through the IT department to QA the application and get final approval to put it out there. So who is likely to be approving whether they should turn this application on for production or not? Someone from the business side. So then we ask, well, how well does the business understand some of the risks that may be out there by doing that kind of an action? Well, they're not too worried. In fact, if you look at this chart, and I know it's a bit of an eye chart, but what you're looking at here is along the side is the percent of business, uh, uh, business decision makers responding to some of the concerns that you see expressed in the middle of the chart. And across the bottom is IT professionals who are expressing their degree of concern around those same factors. And what you can quickly see here because of the gray and white line uh, what segmentation we did is IT is way more concerned about these issues than the business is. In fact, if you look at the business responses higher than 20%, there's only two up there above 20%, and only one higher than 30% which is that they, we cannot manage security to our strict standards. So if it comes back down to, say, something that's going to be according to PCI compliance or HIPAA compliance or so forth, the business might say, let's get IT or security involved. Short of that, they're going to favor agility over any security or governance concerns. So if I was a, a sysadmin and I saw that this is the circumstance I was going into, my first reaction would probably be this. We've got to be careful about all this stuff because ultimately I'm responsible for making sure all of our apps do these things, get protected, meet our requirements, don't expose our PII, don't get us thrown in jail. And I've found in my experience that when I screw this up, I'm the one who gets in trouble. I'm the one who might get fired. Somehow those pesky developers never seem to have as much fire under their feet as I do, the guy who's responsible for the SLA. So this incredibly unfair world that I find myself in isn't real thrilling. So what do you do about it? Well, I highly do not recommend keeping your head in the sand and saying my company is not using any of this stuff in the cloud because our data shows that it's pretty likely that somebody inside your company is taking these steps. And so you need to get involved. And frankly, that's what we're starting to see in our surveys of sysadmins and IT professionals. They're actually starting to wake up to this and say, you know, we can't just catch problems when they happen in the cloud. We can't just wait for the business to come back to us and say, oh yeah, by the way, we're already up in Amazon, or, or for the developer to let it slip that they're putting things in Amazon or Google or other locations. We actually have to have a strategic approach to this. And we see this in our survey data that shows that they're very much starting to awaken to this and say, we do need to have a formal strategy and we're gonna get going on one. So the numbers you see in blue that are going down is a percent who said, we're not going to be strategic about this. So that's a really encouraging sign to see that going way down. And they're also starting to wake up and say, maybe we should have a plan about how we can be putting applications out here in the cloud as well. So we actually know how things get managed and maintained and so forth. And that you can see is the yellow, and that's on its way up. 
The percentages are relatively small here, so there's not a huge amount of effort by IT operations to actively move applications up to the cloud, but this is an awakening, an important part of the awakening. It's absolutely necessary for them to be successful here. Okay, so does sysadmins who run things in the shop today get to run the cloud, and is it the same job that they've had before? Who is a sysadmin overseeing cloud use in the company right now who feels that my job hasn't really changed from the virtualization era or the pre-virtualization era? Anyone? Wow, I'm impressed. You just have that uber knowledge that you're able to manage it all. Most people have seen a pretty significant change. So let's do a little history here. So if you remember back in the 80s and 90s when I was working in the sysadmin role, there was no such thing as a sysadmin in a large company. There was an admin for everything. There were silos of administration over the storage, over the network, over the servers, over everything else. And if your company was running ITIL, you also had processes that guaranteed that absolutely nothing happened quickly. Everything went through a committee. Everything took a long time to get done. The likelihood that you would have high utilization of all the resources and efficient use of the resources was pretty darn difficult. And with this physical, mostly, world that we were in at this time, that just didn't satisfy the business. They wanted to go a little bit faster, but they felt heavily burdened by IT. And then along came this technology that initially developers brought into their organizations called virtualization. And it got its way over into the IT ops side. And the server admin saw this virtualization technology and said, ooh, I see an opportunity here. I could do something pretty cool. I'm going to take this virtualization stuff, and I'm going to take all the physical deploy of applications, and I'm going to pack them onto fewer machines. And suddenly, I'm going to be the catalyst of change in the organization. I'm going to drive huge cost efficiencies in the organization by reducing the amount of servers, making it easier for people to get workloads deployed in minutes. Um, I'm just going to be a total and complete hero. And that turned out mostly to be true. And so the server admin became the virtualization administrator. And those of you in organizations that have heavy degrees of virtualization in the shop today, you recognize that the virtualization manager has risen above all the other silo administrators. Now, in the circumstances in which he could provision his own storage, he could provision his own networks, he could provision his own security, he had the knowledge about all these things, he could indeed continue to deliver agility. He was delivering cost efficiency for sure, but he could deliver agility as well. Now, in the larger organizations, Sadly, he was not able to provision his own storage or provision his own network or do his own security. He still had to go back to the committee. And as he started to manage more and more important workloads, the burden of the committee became more and more important, which meant that virtualization, which at the beginning might have given you your own test environment in 5 to 15 minutes, was now waiting 6, 8, 10 weeks to give you the resources you want and add two or three more weeks if you wanted to take it into production. Now, in this circumstance, it's better than the old physical world, but mostly the storage admin, network admin, security admin, and everybody else started to not really like this virtualization guy who thought he was king of the hill um, and weren't real thrilled that their power had been diminished a bit. One group in particular who was quite frustrated with this was the app manager because they were getting significant pressure from the business for We've got to have new web capabilities. We've got to get mobile apps out there. We've got to have a tablet version. We've got to start doing some BI. You guys need to find a way to get more applications done and built and delivered out there. And along around this time in 2006, 2007, they got a new opportunity, public clouds. With their credit card, they could go and they could get resources, virtual infrastructure, without having to talk to this guy. And in the process of going around them, they were able to use the calling card of the business who would say, this is a business-driven decision. We're empowering you guys to circumvent the traditional IT to get to the resources so you can get things done. And that's exactly where we sit today and why so much shadow IT is happening, where organizations are turning off computers when they don't feel there's enough power in the room, when they try to stop developers from doing things that are really important. Boy, I wish I knew why this machine suddenly went dead. Let's see. Let's see. Which cable is going to fix the problem here? Yeah, see? That was my problem. I never should have pissed off the IT guy. So what happened at that point and what is starting to happen now is that someone from that dev group 
who was reaching out to and was using these public clouds needed to make sure everybody else in the dev team could use these public clouds as well. And so someone had to stand up and be the sysadmin for this cloud environment, create pools, assign pools, make sure we have just one account on Amazon, not one for every single individual developer, make sure that we have connections back into the data center, make sure that we're working off consistent images. Any of this sound familiar? So sysadmin kind of roles. And that's exactly what's happening right now, is we are seeing a new sysadmin be born. And they're the cloud manager. And the cloud manager is not the VMware administrator. It's not the virtualization guy. It is a new guy, and it's a new person that's coming out of a different area. They're coming out of the business, they're coming out of divisional IT, they're coming out of product and service teams, and they're coming directly out of dev. A lot of these clouded managers who are coming into position had previously titles like CTO, developer, DevOps, EA, a variety of other roles. And in the bigger companies that had discrete divisions where they had their own sort of micro IT, they might have carried an IT title. But as they grow into this new position, this is the new disruption for the sysadmin role. So the key question I have to ask everyone who's in a sysadmin role is, are you the VMware administrator who is going to get disrupted, or are you the, the intelligent sysadmin who sees this coming and positions yourself so that you can be the disruptor and you can move into the position of control? That's the big question. Now, I asked the question before, in this new cloud manager role, is it the same job and is it the same skills that you had before? And only one hand went up. And I think I know why your hand went up. Because the actual answer is, for the most part, yeah. You still have to know things about what does it take to deliver an SLA? What does it take to do governance? What does it take to get to the point where you can administer things? But now you have a whole bunch of other responsibilities that go with that. You now have to really work directly with app dev to empower them to use the infrastructure which they can already get access to which means that you have to prove once again your value because the developer already is using the public cloud. He already knows how to set up and configure infrastructure. He already knows how to set up his own pool of resources. He already knows, in many cases, more than you do in terms of how to connect to Jenkins to do a build process, about how to ensure instance recovery, to do A-B testing. These things you may not know, and you're going to have to get to know that if you're going to play this new role. So what makes this person's job different? So we talked about who they come, where they come from. That's obviously different. Their focus is not on the physical infrastructure anymore. It's on the virtual pool of resources, the selection, the collection of apps that are going to be deployed here, and on the cloud to on-premise integrations. That's going to be their primary focus area. They don't have to worry about the hardware anymore. They don't have to worry about too much spending time with the storage admin, the network admin, and everybody else and trying to get them on board, because most of that stuff actually is under their purview and does not have to be directly managed. So that actually frees up an administrator from having to do things like monitor hardware devices, determine if a slot has failed, determine if a hard drive inside of a drive had inside of a server had failed, and do I need to swap the drive out, um, not having to worry too much about a lot of those physical aspects so that they can focus on higher level values. And that's the key thing to take away. The new cloud manager can focus on higher value. They become closer to the business and closer to what the business is trying to, to accomplish. Now, what it takes to succeed here, I, I mentioned that the developers who are already familiar with this cloud platform, they already can access all of these services and capabilities. The biggest mistake you can make as a cloud manager is to say that self-service portal I'm going to make it point to me, and I'm going to make all the developers point to me. The moment you take self-service out of the hands of the developer, they will circumvent you once again. They chose the cloud because self-service allowed them to be agile and to, to deliver the value that they're trying to deliver in a rapid way. So you have to facilitate the ongoing speed, the ongoing agility that's involved there. Second thing you're going to have to learn is the language of the cloud developer. 
where inside of a traditional historical sysadmin role, you might have had VMDK images. And when developers came to you, they requested specific images. And if they wanted to put a particular workload in place, they had to tell you what to put in the VMDK image. And in more cases than not, you did it. So you might have been familiar with Puppet, perhaps, but more likely you were using ISO images and had other tools that you used. In this new developer-driven world, you need to know Chef. You need to understand that they're going to come to you with Chef scripts, and that's the, where they're going to define what they want from a configuration perspective. You're going to have to get to understand how not just instances work, but how groups of instances work, how they define an application, and how they need to operate with one another and talk to one another. Um, and the developer is going to be ahead of you again in knowing this because of how they've been designing and deploying applications up until this point. Where you can add the most value is most developers know a bit about how to achieve an SLA, how to, in, how to consistently keep performance going, how to achieve government and, and, and compliance needs, and how to make applications secure. But they typically don't have nearly the depth in those areas as you do. And this is where you really want to concentrate. Um, I don't know how many of you saw the survey that was done in the middle of last year that did a survey of publicly accessible S3 volumes in Amazon and how many of them had the public port open. Any of you remember that survey? Do you remember how many had the public port open? About half. So that should sell you as a sysadmin, gee, um, maybe I should get involved and make sure that if it's publicly open, it actually should be publicly open, not accidentally exposed. And that's a big role that you can play, making sure there's consistency in how things get deployed. Some of the examples they found in that same study when they looked at it was that the S3 volume that was in production prior, the public port was not open. It got opened during the test dev cycle and rolled into production. So it stayed open. So there's little things like this that a sysadmin who's looking across all the apps understands what our security parameters are and can apply universal looks at that can really play an important role here. You also need to make sure that you understand that the test and dev cycle may be different. Inside the corporation, you may have been doing a lot of linear development. Things get developed, they get moved over into tests, they get moved over into pre-production and QA, they get staged and then they get produced. A lot of what happens in the cloud is continuous integration and con continuous deployment. So you may have a lot of A-B testing going on, and you may have a lot of things that build in completely different cycles where they don't have that linearity. That means you need to know how Jenkins works. That means you need to know how these new processes flow and how you're going to be part of that. More important than anything, you're probably going to have to be able to help the rest of the IT shop see what's going on here in the cloud, and that they shouldn't be worried, and they should trust you as the admin to make sure that things are going to work well here. Um, as I will call back to one of the early slides I talked about, what's one of the biggest things that's happening in the cloud today? Application integration, hybridization. So if all this wacky, cool stuff that's happening out in the cloud is calling into the SAP system, is calling into the database, is calling into the finance system, back in IT, they're going to be quite worried. And they're going to need someone like you who can stand up and say, don't worry, I'm managing these connections. If you're getting a flood, it's because we're making money. Next is really making their jobs easier. So yes, the developers can go out and use the cloud and consume the cloud and do all the things. And even if you're doing a pretty good job of providing those management to them, they might still want to circumvent you. Where you can really start to make their lives easier is where you start to take some of the burdens away from them. So if you're new to being a sysadmin in a company that's got five or six developers who are all using AWS, it's pretty likely those five or six developers all have separate accounts and are all getting billed onto separate credit cards and are all billing it back to the business unit. First thing you should do is get, it back, get down to one admin account where you can have it billed centrally and where you can then show what is going on internally and free them from the credit card. So that's the first thing you want to do. And then secondly is to start monitoring this, this use case. Are we using the cloud efficiently? Are we avoiding a circumstance in which load balancing is going to go through the roof and we're going to have the shock bill? Anyone here had the shock bill? Anyone's shock bill 10x, their average bill? Anybody's 20x, 
Oh, good. See, the sysadmin who stops it at 10x, that is what you want to see. If you guys can get to the point where you can stop the bill at 2x, that's even better. But a lot of you aren't going to feel the shock until you hit 10x. So that's really important. Taking over the bill, doing cost management, understanding which apps are using the cloud in what way, and are they using it appropriately? Are we spending the money as effectively as we should? The third thing is you should absolutely get to know AIM so that you understand how to link the identity system inside of Amazon to Active Directory or whatever you're using on-premise. On There's two big benefits for this. The first is the benefit to the developer that will allow them to have single sign-on into the corporate system and therefore automatically into their AWS account. Second is so that you can align roles, functionalities, business policies, um, as well as onboarding and offboarding of employees. So if somebody leaves the company, they don't leave with your AWS credentials as well. So these are all some of the value adds. What you should then should do is ask yourself, what value adds beyond that can I bring to my developers and to my business? With your own skills, with your own background, as you learn about the cloud, what capabilities and benefits can you bring that will allow the company to move forward? Learning about ops works here, learning about cloud formation here, getting really familiar with Cloud Watch and everything that it can show. These are things that will give you some value add that will allow you to come back to the development team. When you win them over and win their trust, they're far more likely to let you be the master admin over the, over the accounts. And when they see that you will actually speed them up in deploying new applications, rather than bring process, bring ITIL, and slow them down, the more benefits you'll bring to them in the process. As a cloud admin, you have to understand this concept as well. Um, this is what we at Forrester call the uneven handshake. It's something that Amazon talks about as shared responsibility which is understanding where does the cloud service stop from an administration and, and governance responsibility perspective, and what do you have to take over from there? So the classic example that always comes up is, if you want to put a PCI-compliant application into Amazon, can you put anything on top of Amazon, and simply because they have a PCI DSS certification, your PCI? True or false? Anyone? False. Why? Yes, because you can misconfigure your application. You can break the rules and your processes and everything that lies above what Amazon did for you, and now you're out of compliance. So you have to understand this difference. And the more you understand this difference, the more value you can bring to the circumstance. Um, true or false, if you, put if you put your data in Amazon, you are free from the NSA. Take that one home and try that on your security <laughs> administrator. Okay, so the, not only is your job gonna change, but the tools are gonna change a bit as well. And I'm actually gonna be channeling some research here by my colleague Dave Bartoletti, he's in the middle of the room on this side over here. Um, so if you wanna talk more about this, he's the guy to talk to. There's basically three or four layers of management roles that there are tools for that help you manage this cloud environment. So I'm not gonna go through them in depth here, I'm gonna go through them one by one. So first let's talk about cloud delivery. This is the basic set of tools you need in order to provide the basics. Letting the developers access the cloud, doing it in a centralized governed fashion, controlling things through single sign-on, and making not just one cloud service, but multiple cloud services accessible to them in a very simple fashion. This is where you may wanna use a self-service portal or a service catalog tool to provide a view into all the services that they can request. You may wanna use master deployment and master provisioning tools here that know how to deploy the same workload to two or three targets. You may also want to use tools that help you with migration, like you might want to be familiar with Hotlink, which lets you take VMDK files from VMware and transfer them to AMIs, or transfer them to Hyper-V or to other targets that you're going through. The next layer up is in the operations layer, and this is where you're mostly going to be doing some monitoring to start from, and then you're going to get into more active management from there. So this is where you need to get really familiar with cloud. tools. Monitoring the bill, monitoring the performance, monitoring the security, monitoring the access, monitoring which developers access what pools of resources at what times, and was that allowed and was that not allowed. 
In the management side, this is where you want to be able to take actions based on everything that happens there. Um, so earlier today, there was a session on OpsWorks that shows connecting CloudWatch to OpsWorks so that you can start taking actions based on the metering. That may be your approach. You may choose to use WriteScale or other tools instead to make that happen. But at this point is where you really want to start saying, elastic load balancing isn't just a thing. It's something I have to control, and it's something I have to configure. Um, one of the biggest mistakes we see happen around elastic load balancing, just using that as an example, is we have become very, very good at understanding how to make it scale up and how to make it scale up as fast as possible. And we oftentimes forget that when it's no longer active, we probably ought to get it to scale down and make it more fast. And we all would love it if you did that. Um, here's the governance layer. Um, here is where you're going to want to have security and access controls, where you're going to start getting closer to policy-based administration. So if I'm going to deploy an application and it is going to act on PCI, there's a certain set of rules that need to be there for every application that gets deployed. There's a certain set of agents that have to be embedded in that so I can track and audit the use of that application. I may want to log more things than I would have on a traditional application. Um, really having those policies will help ensure that your applications are meeting the government's requirements inside your organization. A lot of policy-based orchestration tools are now on the market. Um, a lot of them are now connected to AWS, and you'll see several of them in the exhibit hall downstairs. So until you've had too many beers, meet with as many of them as you can so you understand the difference, and then have a beer because there's so many of them. But there's lots of good options and choices here to really start to understand this. Now, once you've got sort of your base tools in place, then the next thing you need to think about is connecting to the tools that lie in the data center, the infrastructure and operations tools. Notice that nothing in the blue was an ITIL tool. Uh, nothing was a CMDB. Uh, your company's got those things, and you're probably going to be asked to tie into those processes and dump configuration information into there. So at that point, use the outside APIs of these management tools to communicate with those other tools. There's going to be dashboards that the CIO has, or VPs of infrastructure have, or others in the organization have, and you need to feed those. So they're aware of and can view everything that's going on in the cloud as core part of the portfolio, not this offshoot layer over thing over here that marketing seems to care about. Same thing with development side. A lot of what may happen in development inside the cloud might be continuous integration, continuous delivery, and agile. A lot of what happens inside the corporation, managed by the application development and delivery VP, might not be. It might be using traditional ILMs. It might have a rack or a DAC uh, foundation. In those circumstances, they still need to see how the development process is going. What is the current state of the different tools on one side or the other that are going to talk to each other and be integrated with each other? So they need to work with traditional app dev to say, what do you need to see out of these tools? What visibility do you need to have? What reports do you have? What dashboarding do you have? How can I fit into the application lifecycle management process knowing that ha what happens on the cloud happens differently? And when you've got this full tool set in place, again, you can ask yourself what I mentioned before. What additional value add can I bring? And that additional value add might be things that you've learned just by observing how all these applications deployed that can make the next applications deploy that much faster or be that much more effective, such as good design practices that we've identified, good best fit analysis. Oh, I see that you're building an application that does X. Well, actually, to do X, We've really found that using these types of instances in this region is where we're going to get the greatest efficiency from doing that. Um, you're going to become an expert in DR. How many uh, developers here love DR? Always think about it when you design the app. Really? Come on. Please. We in sysadmins care. Uh, we want to help you. We feel your pain. Um, we want to take that burden on. And being able to the person who can say, these apps are now production, these are now important, we got to protect this data, I know how to do that, I know how to recover it, I know exactly what it means to be across multiple AZs and multiple regions, and why that matters. Matters. Okay, so how do you go down a path of maturity here? Where should you start, and where do you ultimately want to get to as a cloud manager? Well, everyone's going to start out in this cloud experimentation mode. Whether you're Developers have been using the cloud for five, ten years. Uh, What's well, not ten yet? But we're getting there. Um, they have more experience here, but you may not. Which means you've got to start with some of the basics, which is understanding the key differences between the cloud environment that you're in and the non-cloud environment that you're in. Uh, or a workload may be different. Maybe you have workloads that are more expensive to deal with. You need to start 
start familiarizing yourself with the native tools that were provided from those clouds. Um, if you haven't seen the stream of information that's available coming out of CloudWatch or coming out of the cloud billing system, you gotta get familiar with that. Um, how many here love Amazon's billing logs? Ah, good deal. See, this is an advanced sysadmin. When you first look at it, oh my gosh. It gives you so much detail, it's a bit overwhelming. But once you understand the structure and you understand what's in there, you can really turn it into something very powerful. So you've got to get familiar with that. And it's not the same kind of information that you're going to be getting out of other tools. Um, you got to start experimenting as much as you possibly can so that you really understand when's the best time to use a service from Amazon versus to drop a bunch of our own services into instances. In some cases, there may be benefits for that. I may want to put firewalls all over the place rather than just using the standard security services from Amazon. Um, there may be circumstances in which I want to drop riverbeds in place um, rather than just using the basic services. So finding all these different approaches and strategies will help you build these best practices and understand what works and doesn't work so well in the cloud. You really should also start spending a whole lot of time listening to the developers about their development processes. If you haven't worked in an organization or been privy to agile development or cont continuous delivery, you've got to get familiar with this. I know it sounds weird to say, as a sysadmin, you need to understand development process, but in this role, it matters, very much so. Once you've sort of gotten the basics down and you're understanding the use of cloud, you're ready to move on to this, to this cloud leverage stage, which is where you can actually start to say, here are the best practices, here's the best uses of cloud, starting to set policies, starting to guide the developers. At this point, you're able to start doing things like creating ops work stacks for them or helping them uh, make the stacks more efficient, understanding where things should be applied um, and where they should not. Should everything start out with a small or extra small instance and will grow it as time, or should we start a bigger instance and shrink it back down based on performance? Lots of different practices you'll start to feel at this point. At this point, you probably should start to be fairly familiar with Chef so that you can understand and read the contents of a chef script. So you can understand, do you need to make modifications of that? Do you need a tool that makes modifications of that? Uh, you probably should be, at this point, doing some active monitoring of performance of applications. You may be using New Relic. You may be using App Dynamics. You may be using native tools. You want to start really paying attention to how much do I need to start monitoring these things? Because ultimately, the developers are responsible for making it perform, but you're responsible for noticing that it's not. Then you want to start thinking about the integrations, the hybridization. Is this simply an integration to SaaS, or are we going to bring things back on premise? Are we going to have data flowing between the two? Is there a latency issue? How do I best overcome that? Should I be doing direct connect? Is that, there's so much hybridization going on that direct connect is really my best option here. You're going to be in a better position to make those decisions on behalf of everyone in the development group than have one individual developer choose to do that for their particular application. So you're starting to play a much more important role. If the company's doing mobile applications, should you be using a consistent set of mobile backend services across them all? Um, what is that suite? And how much of that is your own intellectual property versus the tools you can get from the platform? And then, of course, the backup and DR that I mentioned. Once you've kind of gotten that down, now it's time to start optimizing. And optimizing is optimizing for a variety of reasons. But more often than not, it's driven by optimizing for the bill. Um, I oftentimes characterize these stages of maturity as the first stage is, wow, the cloud is cheaper. Go, 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 go. Stage two is, oh, I can scale up, and that's really cool. I really like the fact that I can make elastic apps. Let's make everything elastic instead of these static applications we started with over here. Stage three is, I just got the shock bill, and they told me that I'm now on performance review for the next six months, unless I fix this problem. Oh, now that I'm in stage three, let's change our mode from scale up to scale it down as quickly as possible. Let's find all the instances that are in extra larges that really should be in mediums. Let's find all the uses of services out here that haven't been turned on in five weeks. Hey, all you developers who have all your own test beds, did you realize you left all your EBS instances running and you've been backing them all up to S3 and snapshotting them three times? Awesome. Maybe we should fix that. That's a lot of what happens in the optimization phase, is really taking your expertise and your knowledge, looking at it holistically, and saying, this is a set of resources I'm going to manage as a portfolio, and I'm going to help us really maximize how things go forward. And we've seen examples of companies that sit in each of these three circumstances, and it's only really after the shock bill that you really start to pay attention to optimization. But don't wait for the shock bill. If some of the services that you're supporting are services that are deployed and are profit-generating. 
where, meaning you're taking credit cards or you're taking payments for things that go out there. That bill for Amazon supporting that particular application, that is now affecting your margin. That is a cost of doing business. And if you can pay attention to, to it that way, now you've got a much more powerful reason to want to optimize the cost. Because it's not about avoiding the shock bill. It's about making that, prof that product far more profitable. And if you want to get the attention of the CFO and attention of the business leader, tell them about how you're going to add five points of margin to the product. That's the way you're going to get their attention. OK, so what's the top line advice for a new sysadmin who wants to move into this role? First and foremost, find out who in your organization is a cloud developer and get to know them now. Start engaging them on how they're using the cloud, what they're accomplishing, how they do it, what tools they use, why they chose this cloud. But make sure that you do it in, from the perspective of wanting to learn. Because if you're in traditional IT right now and they're shadow ITing around you, they may not really like the fact that you're coming and asking a whole bunch of questions. So you've got to do it from the perspective of, I'm here to help. I want to empower you. I want to be part of your role and your group. That's going to be really effective. Next, figure out what it is that's going to make their cloud consumption easier. What is it that they're struggling with when they're using the cloud? Also take note of all the things they love, and don't screw those up. Next, safety. You're oftentimes put in this role as an administrator so that you can ensure the SLAs of the company, protect the company, protect our data, protect our assets, and more importantly, protect our customers' information and our reputation as a company. Find out where you can add value there. Because pretty much everyone's going to agree, as I showed you on the slide before, where the only piece of data that both, or only risk that both the business and IT cared about was, can we meet security to our high standards? If you can say, I can help us assure that, that's a value add that you want to be delivering. Then pay attention to the economics. The faster you can start getting familiar with how to read the bill, understand the bill, and then map that to utilization of resources and identify gaps, the faster you can start really delivering business value back to the company. And then, once you really know this, start evangelizing it. This is going to seem a little counterintuitive for a sysadmin to be evangelizing the use of a developer tool, but absolutely you want to be doing this. The more that you find you can do in the cloud, the better off you'll be. And if you're coming from a traditional IT shop, here's the sort of really counterintuitive thing. We can do this in the cloud way better then we can do this here on premise. If you can start saying that and recognizing that, and you can evangelize that not with the developers, but with your IT administration colleagues, and we can start evangelizing that with the heads of infrastructure, the CIO, then you can start really opening some eyes. Because at the end of the day, while there may be a whole bunch of server huggers in your organization, or like it all runs in my data center or it runs nowhere, um, ultimately they're getting measured, not on how well they hug and how much is in their arms, but how much cost efficiency they're delivering back to the company. And if you can deliver greater cost efficiency or greater flexibility over here, they'd rather hear that from you than hear that from the dev who's been circumventing them for six months. And then recognize that you are already hybrid, and this is something that actually has to be managed. So you probably hear this if you talk to people in the IT operations world. Well, in the future, when we're hybrid, when we've got a private cloud and a public cloud, we're going to do the following things. Wrong. If you have any SaaS application in your company, you're, I can almost guarantee you are, you're already hybrid. Because one of the very first things almost anyone does with a SaaS application when they put it in place is connect it to something in the data center. The moment that connection has been made, you're hybrid. Now, you may not be really in a position in which you've got to start actively managing that when you have one connection, but when you've got 16 to 30 of those connections coming in, and when you're starting to build applications in Amazon and call them back to a database or tie them back to an ERP system, now you've got to manage this thing. The sooner you can recognize that and start actively managing the hybrid world, the better off you'll be. So let's look at that for a second. What is the hybrid world? This is the hybrid state that we're in right now. And over time, it's just going to get more and more like this picture. So when you take a look at this picture, what you see is on one side, left or right, depending on how you're looking at this, is all the stuff that your company will spend CapEx dollars on. They will spend CapEx dollars on applications that are deployed on physical infrastructure, 
They'll virtualize a bunch on top of other physical infrastructure, but mostly deploy static applications. And then they'll try to build an internal cloud, which hopefully will be a multi-tenant self-service and all those other things. Even if they do the internal cloud, that's still a CapEx expenditure. They're still going to be buying and owning and having to uh, depreciate over time the physical assets that are underneath that internal cloud. So this is a deliberate deployment investment in the capital side. On the other side of the chart is all the things that they can spend OPEX dollars on. And when they're spending OPEX dollars, they're not necessarily getting flexibility, which is what the CFO is really after. If they simply outsource to traditional outsourcing or they outsource to virtual hosting, as is most of the hosting solutions that are out there today, there's still pretty much a fixed OPEX expenditure. Traditional outsourcing is a three to five year contract, which in some cases you can actually depreciate in some companies, other companies you can't. On virtual hosting, minimum amount you're probably gonna spend is 12 month commit for the set of virtual resources. So that's also a fixed OPEX expenditure. If the company wants flexible OPEX, they have to go to the far ball. That's the only place they can truly get a no commit to a set of resources and flex the resources and cycle them up and down based on business cycle use. And that's what's most attractive to the CFO. So the more that you can really help the CFO understand that that's the only bucket that does, the more is going to start moving over there. Now, some people have seen this chart and they've said, well, in 10 years, that won't look that way. Maybe not. How many of you in your companies have a mainframe? How many of you believe in 10 years you won't have a mainframe? Like I said. So yes, a lot of the assets, frankly, are more expensive to move at all than to leave them there running and doing what they do today. And so we're still going to have a hybrid world long term. Will you push more and more of this to the public cloud and possibly push more and more internal applications to the internal cloud? Yeah, most likely you will. There's definitely efficiencies to achieve from there. But we have to recognize that when an application gets designed, it's not necessarily going to the yellow ball. It might actually have parts that go to the yellow ball and parts that go to other locations for a variety of reasons. And if that's the case, then you have to make sure that you manage all the balls, not have separate management for each of the individual balls in your environment. And that requires that you have three components at the top of the entire portfolio. One is a self-service portal or a service catalog through which you can articulate the demand of the application and the use case, which helps you determine where that application should land. Next, you want to have a workload automation solution at that top level that can take those characterizations that came through the catalog and deploy them appropriately. Apply the right security, apply the right agents, put the right monitoring in place, lay down the appropriate load balancing, depending on where the application is going to be deployed. And then you also want to be able to centrally deal with governance, regulatory, and compliance needs at that same level by having policy orchestration and administration working hand in hand with the workload automation to ensure that the right deployments go in the right place. So when we talk about all the tools that are out there today for managing the cloud, if you look at the core capabilities of them, they typically have a self-service portal or service catalog, some degree of workload automation, and some degree of policy-based administration. So they're all vying for this top position as are the traditional enterprise tools. The BMCs, the HPs, the Tivolis of the world are vying for that position as well. So there's going to be an interesting battle over time to see who ultimately gets to control all of this stuff. But the faster you can start realizing that you need to have dashboards for the apps that look at wherever the app is deployed, and can I ensure that I'm meeting my corporate responsibilities, the better off you're gonna be. So that's a look at the sysadmin role. Who's ready to sign up? Well, if you want to know more and you're really interested in going deeper into this topic, these are all the people at Forrester, actually there's even more than these, who are covering various aspects of the cloud. Engage with us. We can help you see the best practices being done by other companies, the emerging practices and new capabilities and functions that are going on out there, um, and answer specific questions you have about different implementation types.